I'm going to dive right in, if that's okay. Last week, I mentioned to you about the state of Germany pre-World War II and what was going on with the Nazi regime and the complacency of the church that allowed that. The 12,000 pastors who did nothing, the 3,000 pastors who opposed it, and only 3,000 pastors who stood for the truth. And comparatively speaking, in Eric Metaxas' book, The Letter to the American Church, we find the United States of America in the very same place, the church, as the church was in Germany at that time. Very complacent, <clears throat> very complacent, and uh, very accepting. And I'm going to qualify that word or quantify that word in just a, a minute because that, that can be a misnomer. Um, I gave you a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer that says, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. And basically the charge was, I highlighted quite a few things last week that typically have been seen in our culture as political, uh, but they're not political, they're more than political. And uh, they're actually moral issues. And uh, I, I talked about abortion, I talked about LGBTQ, I talked about critical race theory. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned Black Lives Matter, but I did today, okay? Um, talked about transgenderism and border control and uh, any other thing that, that could cause a riot. I mentioned it last week, okay? And I want you to understand that my goal in talking about those things is not to cause a riot. It's not to incite Christians to like, yeah, now we're going to go do something. Okay. Um, our goal is to, yes, go do something, but it's to do it in love. And for those who, who were here last week and you heard me share those things and you felt empowered, well, great, I'm glad. But if you felt empowered to now... Uh, to be as if I was angry or I didn't like any of the people who do the things that I talked about last week, then you don't know me, okay? And it's important that you know me because my heart is not, I'm not against people who do those things. The Apostle Paul said that if you've sinned on one point of the law, you've sinned on all of them. I'm, what I was talking about last week and what I'm going to continue to talk about today is some of the things that we as the church have become accepting of calling them okay when actually the Bible calls them sin. Now, we still have every obligation to love. People matter more. We love people. And the first approach that we have with somebody, whether they're wearing a pride shirt or whether they're a heterosexual sin or whatever it may be, a gossip, a liar, or whatever it may be, our first approach to them is to say, hey, Jesus loves you. Every other sin, listen, before somebody comes to, to the knowledge of Christ, every other sin in their life is irrelevant at that point. We don't address, we don't go to somebody and say, oh, you've got this sin in your life. If they're without Christ, that's to be expected. We shouldn't be surprised that the world is doing things that, that don't line up with the Bible, okay? We should be surprised when the church starts lining up with the world. Okay? So... I, just, I wanted to be clear about that before I begin today. Um, there is a, uh, there's supposed to be a difference between how we act and how the world acts. And um, there's going to be a difference, for example, if somebody was to come in here. And, it, and I had somebody ask me this this week. Pastor, what would you do if there were people who were part of any of those things that you mentioned, they came in and said, we want to be part of this church. I would say, we love to have you here. Um, we're glad you're here because it's here that you're going to hear the gospel that will set you free from the, from the deception that you're in. 
It's here that you're going to hear the truth. Now, there's a difference between attending this church and being a part of the family of God. And we would welcome anybody. I, I mean anybody. I would welcome anybody to come in here unless they started causing division in the church then we would do what the New Testament says to do. We would remove them from the fellowship. But we would welcome anybody from any background or any particular sin to be a part of this church because we all are guilty of sin. Okay? So all are welcome here. But in order to be a part of the family of God, you have to determine that Jesus' Jesus's way are higher than your ways. And when somebody says... Well, I believe that it's okay for me to, to do this, even though the Bible says it's not okay. That's where, the, that's where they have disqualified themselves from calling Jesus Lord. Lord means that he is over every part of your life. He's either Lord of all or Lord not at all. Okay? So, is that clear? Okay. All right. Good. I don't want to spend too much time introing, but I feel like if I don't, this, these things are important to understand, um, that we're called to love everyone, but, but we're not called to love their sin. And, and I, I know that there are people in sin will, will think that we're okay because we accept them relationally, and we're supposed to accept everyone relationally, Amen. okay? The problem comes in when people uh, want them to affirm what they're doing or even further, enable them. And when you don't affirm and enable the sin of people, that's where the world today is pointing its finger to the church and saying, you're the problem. You're the one causing the trouble. You just won't accept everything. Well, we're going to continue to use the Word of God to determine what behavior is acceptable and what behavior is not acceptable, okay? And so that's that. So today, I want to talk to you about biblical biology. Are you ready? <clears throat> okay. This is going to sound very primary, and while I apologize for that, I don't because, unfortunately, we've digressed as, as people in our culture to, not under, to, to forego, to work around what is, what is the obvious in order to get what is selfish. So someone who is biologically a male or female is based on four things. It's based on their internal reproductive organs, their external sexual anatomy, uh, endocrine systems that produce secondary sex characteristics, and the presence or absence of a Y chromosome. Okay? Now, those things, they are biologically established. They're an objective scientific fact. Okay? Church didn't make that up. Okay, that is a scientific fact. So let's just understand this is the way that we were made. Uh, we're biologically male or female, uh, biologically a race of men and women. Uh, and there's no in between. There's not a third option. Now, some people's interpretation of their sex uh, and what they view their bodies may be socially constructed, it may be personally informed, but it's not biblically backed, okay? Um, but sex itself is not socially constructed. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. I want to look at a few passages today, and most of what I'm going to talk to you today about has to do with a phenomena called transgenderism. And whether it's transgenderism or homosexuality, and again, let me just reiterate, those two sins are not any greater. If you're a guy here living with your girlfriend and you're sleeping together, 
it's the same. The Bible sees that as the same. It's, it, it's sin, okay? If you're having sex outside of marriage, it's a sin. Repent, get restored to God, okay, and stop. All right. <clears throat> um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So we were made in the image of God, man and woman. And he establishes this, male and female, which means that sexuality isn't just about what you do. It's not about how you feel. Um, it's about who you are. It's about who you were made by and why you were meant to be made. These are things that are established already. Being male and female is rooted in biology. Okay. I'm just hoping to... Make sure that we as a church understand this. It's not something that's plastic. It's not fluid. It's not on a spectrum. It's yes or no. I know you're thinking, Pastor, we get it. But I, I know you say you get it, but there are Christians who don't anymore. And and you may not know them, but I do. There are popular Christian leaders right now who are, who've become accepting of this ideology that, that it is fluid. It is on a spectrum. It is not black and white. And that's a lie. And we need to recognize that that's a lie. God, God says something here. He says that, be fruitful and multiply, which is the secondary reason for design. So let me address homosexuality for just a moment. The reason that that is wrong is that the, the ordaining of the relationship of who God created, part of that design is that they must be able to procreate. And if you can't procreate, then you're outside of God's intent. And this is why... It's a sin. You've deviated from the original intent of who God designed you to be. That's why God is angry about this sin. That's why he's angry about any sin. We've deviated from his truth. So when somebody says, I, I, I feel there's a difference from my biological perspective and my psychological or my internal self, when somebody feels that, which one determines who they really are, okay? Well, scientifically, it says that you are a male or female. Biblically, it says you're a male or female. But culturally today, there's a third option that says I, I will be who I want to be because I'm disassociating my biological self from my internal self. I know it's, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but you need to understand. Some of you are looking at, look at like I've got three eyes. I, I know there are, we, you need to hear this in case you've been living in a cave and have missed this. Um, there are two categories regarding gender. There's gender roles and there's gender identity. And gender roles describe the, the social and the cultural aspects of being male and female. For example, masculinity versus femininity. Uh, guys wear blue, girls wear pink, okay? Gender role things. By the way, you know, there was a time 100 years ago where men wore pink, and it was a manly color and not a woman color. Okay. And that's, not a, that's irrelevant. Okay. Uh, but these are largely built around stereotypes, gender roles. Gender identity 
has to do with the psychological aspects associated with being male or female. Someone's internal self as a male or female, which brings us to the transgender issue. The word transgender today is being used to describe the different ways that some people experience the tension between their biological sex and their gender, either gender role or gender identity. And so because of this tension that that people are experiencing between who they are biologically and what they feel inside about themselves, there's a rise in the number of people who now feel that it's justifiable that they change how they were biologically made in order to fit what they want to be. Does that make sense? I know it doesn't make sense, but do you get what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. In the heart of the transgender argument is the difference between these two, that sex and gender are two different things. And that sex has biological overtones, but, but gender doesn't, that it's cultural. And what's not being accounted for here are so many things. I want you to understand how the, the enemy, Satan, our enemy, is working in the earth today to deceive. And it's been, listen, it's been a long game for him. And I want to encourage us, church, we need to start thinking about the long game. We often want something quick and turned around because that's how we are in America. We're able to get it and just fix it. But the enemy has been working the long game here. We need to start thinking about the long game. And I'm, I'm very grateful for some of the things that are happening right now in our state and in our nation, laws that are being passed and things that are action that's being taken. And people are starting to wake up to this and, and realize that, hey, this is not right and we've got to do something about this. So we've got to start thinking about that. But what's not being accounted for is what what is the the devil been doing <laughs> what has he been up to and in the in the sense of you've got uh you've got these things happening and the church we've buried our heads there are people now young people um who are heavily influenced by social media and, and i'm going to talk about this more in just a moment Um, there is a mental disorder called gender dysphoria. And it affects 0.02% of a population. 0.02%. And up until 10 years ago, the high majority of people who experienced true gender dysphoria as a mental disorder were male. Now, here's why it's important for us to recognize this is more than just all of a sudden it's been a repression for decades and, and centuries that people just have always felt this way and now they're just able to express it. Because over the last 10 years, the needle has moved all the way over and it's almost all females who now are experiencing this. And that's not, that's not typical of a way a mental health issue happens. And so today you have this issue of people who are saying... Um, I, I do not line up with the way I am biologically made. Did we stop and have we stopped and thought about this for a moment? That these young, young children who are experiencing this are also going through puberty at the time? And that there are things, if you remember, before this became an option, do you remember when you went through puberty that you thought, there, there's things about my body I don't like? Right? I mean, it's just a time of change. Just because you feel like there's a change coming on doesn't mean that you change the way God made you. It doesn't mean that you change the truth. It doesn't give you a right to, to go and, and rewrite the law of God. And so a, a, another statistic that you probably won't see much of is the number of young people who have gone through uh, transgender changes have prior to had other mental health issues, including depression, suicidal thoughts, etc. 
And another statistic that you probably won't see is the number of people who have more of those after they make their transition. And the reason is, is because they realize what they thought this lie was going to bring them fell through. When somebody feels an incongruency with their biology and with their psychology, it's our goal as a church to help them understand that healthy psychology will always line up with your biology. Right? Does that make sense? In other words, when... when When a person is struggling and saying, I know that I'm made this way, but I feel differently. Well, it's our job as Christians to say, well, Psalm 139 says that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. So therefore, let's help you align your thinking with your creation. Okay? That's our responsibility. Now, it's not our job to judge them and to be mean to them and to ridicule them. And uh, our job is to love them into the kingdom. And the Holy Spirit wants to bring them to this unity. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. Let's just talk about something else. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5 says, A woman must not wear men's clothing nor a man wear woman's clothing, for the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. Well, pastor, that's Old Testament. You're right, it is. And there's a principle here, too. It's a timeless principle that hasn't changed. Oh, pastor, but culture changes, and we should be, our, our clothes should change, too. Listen, this is not, this is not a Pentecostal holiness message that says women can't wear slacks anymore, all right? You, women can't wear jeans and, you know, that's not what this is about. The reason that God gave this law to Moses to give to the people of Israel is because the intention of a person trying to dress like the other sex to look like the other sex is once again denying the original intent of creation. And that is offensive to God. Because God made male and female. And when the female decides she's going to try to dress like a man so that she can look like a man, not because she just wanted to wear a pair of slacks, all right? Different. God is a discerner of the heart. Okay? So we could, we could talk about, you know, they, he, he wore a pink shirt, she wore slacks all day long. That's, that's not the issue here. The issue here is that there's a principle that violates the created order and the image that God made you in. That's what this verse is about. And so, there's a, a place, and I just, I just read this. There's a, um, a place in Disney. I, I, it's apparently uh, some shop in Disney called Bibbidi Bobbidi. Uh, boutique, okay, and it has something to do with you go in there and your children can go in there, and up to this point they could become uh, they dress them. They have people who are fairy godmothers who come out and they help them to find the, to turn them transform the little girls into princesses or the little boys into princesses or princes and knights or whatever. Recently. Um, they now have a male who is dressed as a fairy godmother, and now he helps the little girls turn into princes. Or they, they don't even use dreamers. They don't even use the term in Disney anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, they use the term dreamers of all ages. They've been doing that for a while, just to be accepting. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, 
It says, don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, who commit adultery or male prostitutes or practice homosexuality, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. I want you to hear, Paul isn't saying that anyone who's ever done this is going to go to hell. Paul is saying that if you're in that lifestyle, stop it, repent of it, be free, and Jesus will save you. But he's saying that if you choose to say, nope, I want this lifestyle, I'm not surrendering to Jesus. I love Jesus, he's my savior, he's my king, but I also am going to live my lifestyle that's contrary to what Jesus King says I can do. And Jesus King says that when the day comes and you stand before my throne and you, you say, I did it my way, I'm gonna say, and it's my way or the highway, right? And so I, I, I know that sounds hard, but that's the truth. And there are going to be people who are going to choose their lifestyle over Christ. And again, our job is, in, in this passage here, just let me expound a little bit. This Greek word that Paul uses uh, when he talks about male prostitution, it refers to, when, to men who are acting like women. Men who are acting like women. And again, it violates the intent, the, the original intent behind the creation that God made them. Romans 1.26 says, That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. There's a natural way, church. Again, I feel foolish sometimes having to say this. And yet I know that Paul had to write this 2,000 years ago because there was coming a time when false teachers would come into the church and say, well, that's not really what he meant. And this Gnosticism has been going on for hundreds of years to make us think that, well, there's another interpretation of Scripture. And that's the lie that's being um, perpetuated inside the, the body of Christ today. That Well, that's not really what that meant. And I'm... I, I need you to understand and hear the word of the Lord today that there is a natural way. There is a natural way that God has made us. And when you go away from that natural way, you've gone away from the way of God. The primary reason that that idea is wrong in Romans that Paul's writing about is that it transgresses the sex distinctions once again. I'm running out of time. Um, so let me just talk about the term transitioning. Um, this is a term that's used to describe the process of when somebody feels the incongruency of their biology with their psychology, and they say, I'm going to become transgender. I'm going to turn myself into something else. It's called transitioning. And it begins at different levels. There's a social level. Then there becomes a physical level. Uh, there's the moving the marker where you actually change your name, and then you may start taking, you may be chemical induced, and you start taking hormones, and you start having surgeries, and you go through the transition. Um, what would Jesus say about medical transitioning? Don't do it. Um, I believe he would say, let's help you to learn to live in acceptance of your created design. That's, that's our responsibility is to help people to understand that, that there's a way that they were made that's better than the lie that they've been told that they can become something else and be better. Being male and female is part of the image that God has made us. When you transition, if someone was to transition away from that, it doesn't draw you closer to God. It moves you further away from that image. You become less like God. And I know that you're saying, well, I would never do that, Pastor. Why are you teaching me? Because you may not realize it, but your kids and your grandkids right now are being bombarded by the world to do these things. I want to, I just want to skip down. I want to read uh, a little bit of a story to you. And it's by a, a woman. She's an attorney in San Carlos, California. Her name is Erin Friday. 
And she had a daughter in Central Middle School in San Carlos, California, not Florida. Um, and she overheard her 11-year-old daughter and her friends in the backyard playing one day. And she heard them all, they were picking letters from the alphabet of what they were going to be, new identities. Going to be L, Q, T. Uh, and she heard her daughter say, I'm going to be pansexual. Now she says, my 11, there's nothing sexual about my 11-year-old daughter. She said, but I figured they're just going through puberty. I wonder what's going on at the school. I'm not sure. Hmm. And then came the trading in of my little pony for combat boots. And then the red and green hair dye came out. And then the selecting of male names took place. And then she said, I got really concerned because half of her boys, or Girl Scout troop came out and said, we're transgender. Now imagine that. All of a sudden, half of a troop out of nowhere, they're transgender. You think it's in the blood? No. It's in the lie. So she goes to the school and she discovers that there's a sex education curriculum that's being adopted by a third party. By the way, that's happening here in our state, if you're not aware of that. And that's why you need to be very aware, parents, of what curriculum your kids are being taught in public schools. This curriculum was a five-hour curriculum, and one hour of that curriculum, a total hour, was taught about gender ideology. Okay? And so she complains about it, goes to the school board about it, and uh, and she says that uh, she founds out she found out that the school was calling her daughter by her new pronoun behind her back. So she goes and complains about it. Um, she gets home. Child protective services show up at her house, and then soon afterwards, the police. And I want you to see that this is how the the lie of the enemy turns into fear to try to create fear. If you're gonna push back as a believer in Christ, if you're gonna push back against the lie of the day, the enemy is going to roar. But you have to remember, he can, he, he's defeated. So he can bring all the fear he wants. And, and here's the long story short, is that she's gradually been able to backtrack and start working through these issues with her daughter, and her daughter now is her daughter again. And that's a great, uh, a great thing. Um, there was a, another young lady. I got a picture of this, and then I'm going to close. Okay. This is Helena Kirshner, and she actually detransitioned. So when she was, in the, she was a teenager, she was influenced by her group of uh, peers to become a boy, and that was how she found acceptance. So she became a boy, and she took hormones, testosterone, for a year and a half. They, it made her very ill, made her very sick. And this was her, uh, her comment after she detransitioned and decided that she didn't no longer want to be here. She said this, there was an overwhelming degree of affirmation from doctors, mental health practitioners, and friends when I wanted to transition. But on the other side, when I said I didn't want to no longer be the boy, I wanted to detransition, she said, those cheering voices were silent and her existence was ignored. That's the devil. So how do we approach someone who identifies a way outside of their God-given design with love, with, comp with compassion? Listen, this has always been about identity. It started in the Garden of Eden when the devil says, you know, God said that if you eat of that tree, this will, uh, he, what he really is keeping from you is that you'll become like him. And Adam and Eve said, oh, I want to be like him. I, 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 I no longer want to be subservient to him. I want to be like him. When the devil tempts Jesus in the wilderness, what's the one thing that he says to him? He says, did God really say, if you are the son of God, He's questioning his identity, and it's the same test that you and I face today. If the devil can steal your identity of who you are in Christ and get you to believe the lie, he wins. And that works for anybody. It's about identity. I am a child of God. I'm chosen, 
not forsaken. I am a child of God. And I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And you need to continue to tell your kids that. You need to continue to tell your grandkids that. They're fearfully and wonderfully made. God made them just the way they are. They don't need to change. You love them just the way they are. Let's stand up together. Father, as we leave this place today, we're reminded of how good it is to be made in your image. And it's a privilege. And we're also reminded, Lord, that there is a lie that's being told by our enemy to get others to believe that they are not all they can be. But if they would change, they could be. Father, we pray that we would be salt and light, that we would continue to be truth, that we would continue to be the voice of truth, even when it speaks against the culture. Use us, Jesus. We ask in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. I hope you come back next week. So we're going to shout and go out and be the feet of Jesus and the voice of Jesus. You ready? One, two, three. Lead someone to life. Amen.